A meteoroid, a lump of stone and metal floating in space. Nudged by the planet's gravity, it hurtles towards the Earth at 11 kilometers per second. As it hits the atmosphere, its tremendous speed compresses the air in front of it. This heats it, causing material to burn off, a process called ablation, forming its distinctive tail. Streaking through the atmosphere, visible from the ground, we call it a meteor, a shooting star, if it's bright enough, a bolide. Many meteors are so small that they burn up in the atmosphere, but around 45 a day hit the ground, the majority just a few grams of material by this point. Very occasionally, meteorites weighing tons collide with Earth. Today we understand what they are and why they arrive. If we're lucky, we can also capture the largest on camera. It's rare that a hefty meteorite lands somewhere people would notice immediately. But over history, people have come across them. Lumps of rock, or occasionally, iron. Soon human labour transformed that iron into trinkets, tools, and even weapons. In 1922, Howard Carter and co. cracked open the tomb of Tutankhamun, pharaoh of Egypt, who reigned roughly 3,300 years ago. Among the treasures he was buried with was a piece of meteorite fashioned into a knife, a ceremonial iron blade. Its handle and sheath are made of gold, likely a gift from a nearby kingdom. Smelting the ability to retrieve a bounty of iron from ore requires people to tame enormous temperatures for sustained periods. Advanced technology. At the time of his burial, smelting was extremely rare and its product, iron, more valuable than gold. The true Egyptian Iron Age would not begin for many centuries after Tutankhamun's death. The iron artifacts that date from before a civilization's Iron Age are likely to be meteoric in origin. Materially, meteoric iron is distinguishable from ordinary terrestrial iron by its high nickel contents and meteoric iron is absent of any of the byproducts of smelting. Scientists have also uncovered the trace of a distinctive crystalline pattern in Tutankhamun's dagger, which could only be caused by the metal cooling exceptionally slowly, uninterrupted, over millions of years. Heat dissipates very slowly in space, in a vacuum, absent a medium that would carry the energy away. Freshly deposited meteoric iron is as old as the solar system and yet unblemished by chemical or geologic forces we find on Earth, like rust. Meteorites are natural time capsules, helping us understand how the planets and asteroids of our solar system formed. All iron, just like many other elements on Earth, formed in the explosions of dying stars billions of years ago before the planets of our solar system formed. Tutankhamun's knife is just one of a number of objects made by the ancient Egyptians from meteoric metal. What we know as iron in English today was known as metal of the sky, or metal from heaven, to the ancient Egyptians. Although possibly heaven is unrelated to its origin, rather a boast of the metal's quality. However, there are etymological coincidences elsewhere, like the Greek word for iron, sideros, is related to the Latin word for star, sidera. In Tibet, Namchag means sky metal and has been used to make ornamental brooches, buckles, arrowheads and such like for many centuries. We have discovered 5,000 year old beads created from meteoric iron in Geza Cemetery, south of Cairo. These tiny items were fashioned by beating the material without heating. Meteoric iron swords are everywhere in fantasy. Take Tolkien's Anglachel and Anguirel swords from Middle-earth. Their meteoric iron is black, a common theme in fantasy. They both glow faintly and are possibly sentient. Sokka's sword in Avatar is meteoric in origin. There are lots of strange things that have fallen from the sky in the lore of Elden Ring, to which George R. R. Martin contributed. In fact, the meteoric ore blade is where the idea from this video came from. 
Vibranium from Black Panther is a meteoric supermaterial used to make all kinds of fanciful technologies. In fact, T'Challa's throne displays the distinctive Widman Staten pattern that is found in real-life meteoric iron. In fantasy, meteoric iron is unusually powerful, even magical, but in reality it's little different from ordinary smelted iron. Its significance in real life surely comes from its rarity. Let's look at some other meteoric iron weapons and tools from across the world. Four and a half thousand years ago, the Hattite culture of modern day Turkey produced a meteoric iron dagger, the Alaka Hoyak dagger. It predates the local Iron Age by a thousand years. Today, the iron has all but rusted away, while the encasing gold components are unblemished. Like Tutankhamun's dagger, this one was found in the tomb of a prince or a king. Geochemical analysis, looking at the composition of impurities in the iron, proves its meteoric origin. The Hattians, to whom the dagger belonged, named their land Hattai. Later, the more well-known Hittites took their name from this. Nearby, dating several hundred years after the Hattian dagger, the city-state of Ugarit also produced a meteoric iron axe. Although there is no direct evidence of this, it's of a similar time and geographically close to Tutankhamun's dagger. Could they be connected? 10,000 years ago, a meteorite massing more than 200 tons broke up and fell on Cape York, northern Greenland. When they came across it, the local Inuit people referred to the largest fragment as Savixoa, the Great Iron. For centuries, the Inuit peoples have used this cosmic detritus as a source of iron for flint, tools, and the tips of harpoons. The meteorites are covered in evidence of mining on their surface, and after being hammered into shape, these fragments of meteorites would be attached to horn or bone. Wood is scarce this far north. Material from this meteorite is found across the Arctic archipelago and even the North American mainland, indicating the material was traded far and wide. In 1894, the American Robert E. Peary found and sequestered several fragments, including the largest, which he sold to the American Museum of Natural History, where it is still today. At 31 tons, it's so heavy, a frame reaching into the bedrock is required to support it. Minnick, an Inuit boy who was brought back to New York from Greenland with Peary, had this to say. Our sole supply of flint for lighting and iron for hunting and cooking implements was furnished by a huge meteorite. This Peary put aboard his steamer and took from my poor people who needed it so much. Before the Chinese Iron Age, approximately 3,000 years ago in the early Chol period, we have found two weapons, an axe and a dagger, entirely rusted. Found in the modern day Henan province, their decoration and rarity suggest they were ceremonial. Normally such weapons would be made of jade. The axe contains traces of the telltale Widman Staten pattern. The nickel content of both is also highly suggestive of their origin, but required technical chemical analysis to determine. The giant crystal pattern in the metal shows it could only have cooled extremely slowly in space, in the core of an asteroid, shielded from the sun. Crystals in metal are found practically nowhere else. In prehistoric Namibia, a meteor fell to Earth. It entered the atmosphere at a shallow angle, making it a spectacle unlike anything seen in modern times. The meteorite takes its name from the nearby town, Gibeon. Material from the meteor broke off in the atmosphere, comprising a field of debris that spread hundreds of kilometers, the largest such strewn field of any meteorite found. The local Nama people fashioned the iron from this meteorite into the tips of spears known as Asagai. These weapons were used commonly across southern Africa until the firearm superseded it. Aborted attempts of cuts can be found on the surface of the meteorites. John Herschel, son of William Herschel who discovered Uranus, identified from samples that the Gibeon meteorite was of extraterrestrial origin, noticing the high quantity of nickel. Namibia is also the home of the Hoba meteorite, 
the largest intact meteorite known. A Menomini myth goes like so. When a star falls from the sky, it leaves a fiery trail. It does not die, but its shade, its spirit, goes to the place where it dropped to shine again. It's unclear how different cultures connected meteorites, lumps of metal strewn across the Earth's surface, with meteors, the streaks of light in the sky. But this myth points to the idea that there was some understanding across Native American cultures. A Muscogee legend indeed called meteorites heavenly excrement. The Hopewell people, who inhabited central continental United States around 2,000 years ago, buried their dead in mounds. Alongside their dead, ceremonial or ornamental items were placed, some made of copper, others knives, axes and other trinkets made of iron. Iron that came from at least two separate meteorites. The Brenham meteorite struck 20,000 years ago. Fragments, fashioned into axes, tools, jewellery and more, travelled over 1,500 kilometres to be buried in mounds alongside their owners. Significant for their rarity and material properties, less so for their origin. The second meteorite, which fell near modern-day Anoka, Mississippi, was chipped away at and traded along the Mississippi and Illinois rivers. There are striking coincidences between the various disparate cultures in this regard. The value of rare metals, the significance of burial, and what one is buried with. After people learn to tame huge temperatures and unlock the ability to extract iron from the ground, meteoric iron takes upon a more ceremonial status. In Java, chris are made from multiple layers of metal, folded and welded together. Iron from a meteorite discovered roughly 250 years ago near the Hindu temple complex of Prambanan is sometimes added to the knives. The meteorite's landing place only adds to the knives' already deeply spiritual function. In the early 1600s, a meteor fell on Punjab, India. From the sky came thunderous fire that terrified the locals, thought to be sent from God. Iron from this small meteorite was mixed with terrestrial iron and used to make two swords and a dagger by order of the Mughal emperor. Tsar Alexander I was presented with a meteoric iron sword made from a nickel-rich meteorite that fell on the Cape of Good Hope for his help in defeating Napoleon's forces in 1814. Today, even in the age of global industrialization and mass production, there are still weapons being made of the stuff. After being knighted, Terry Pratchett forged a sword containing a small amount of meteoric iron he named Thunderbolt Iron. The rest of the ore he mined and smelted himself. In Japan, the Tentetsuto, a recently created Sword of Heaven, is displayed alongside a piece of the Gibeon meteorite from which it was forged. Any natural object that hits the ground is called a meteorite. The tiniest and most numerous meteorites, micrometeorites, are fragments of comets like the Leonids, material from the comet Temple Tuttle. The largest meteorites are much rarer and have a different composition and a different history. Before a large meteorite has a random encounter with the Earth, it probably had been orbiting the Sun undisturbed for billions of years. Although occasionally meteorites are planetary detritus ejected when an asteroid collides with a planet, it's entirely possible, although unlikely, that life first came to Earth hitchhiking on a meteorite that was ejected from another planet, say Mars. Panspermia. Many asteroids are native to the asteroid belt, found between Mars and Jupiter. It is the scattered material of a planet that never was. Jupiter's immense gravity disrupts the belt, prohibiting it from coalescing. The vastly different materials that comprise asteroids suggests that this region of space has collected material from all over. And unlike many representations in film, the asteroids are extremely distant from each other. A probe sent through the asteroid belt has such a tiny, tiny chance of collision, it's not even factored into the flight path. The tiny moons of Mars are captured asteroids. Hold on, meteorites, asteroids, comets, 
What's the difference? Meteorite and meteor are related to the word for meteorology, weather forecasting, both referring to places up high where we see the meteorites burn up. Any such object that falls from space is a meteorite no matter its origin, unless I suppose it's man-made. A meteoroid is the object in space. When it burns up in the atmosphere, we call it a meteor. Finally, the object that touches the Earth's surface is a meteorite. I know, it's confusing. Asteroid has the same root as astronomy, aster, stars. But asteroids are most certainly not star-like. They are a relatively recent discovery. The first and largest asteroids were discovered in the early 1800s. But soon so many of these tiny planets between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter have been discovered, it became somewhat of an embarrassment. Just as with Pluto recently, astronomers then refined the concept of planet, thereby demoting Ceres, Vesper, and the now millions of small rocks that we know of to a new kind of object, asteroids. Long ago, planets were known as wandering stars. From wandering, we get planets. From stars, asteroids. The planets follow easily predictable paths around the sun. Asteroids are small and easily pushed around, leading to untidy, chaotic movements, sometimes collision. The most significant of which, at least as far as Earth life is concerned, ended the reign of the dinosaurs. Meteorites are sometimes confused with comets. Comets are made of ice and carbon, but little to no metal, with extremely elongated orbits. Their long tails erupt when they briefly encounter the raw heat of the sun, but their orbits are long and for the most part, cold and lonely. Beyond Neptune, comets pass through the Kuiper Belt, an area sparsely inhabited with dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris and other small bodies. Even beyond the Kuiper Belt, a hypothesized shell of material lies, the Oort Cloud. When one such body is disturbed, it will fall into the inner solar system, where we will bestow it with the name Comet, from the ancient Greek for hair. But so far from the Sun's illumination, the tiny bodies beyond Neptune are barely known of at all. There are only a small number of meteoric artifacts known. But one day, perhaps space-born industries will forge metal from asteroids into habitation for our descendants. Asteroid mining avoids one of the most challenging aspects of mineral extraction on Earth, or any other planet, gravity. Heaving raw material into space is impractical. It's more efficient to extract all the basic elements we need out there. Comets, too, can provide water for astronauts, just as they may have brought the oceans to Earth billions of years ago. Finally, and most recently discovered, there are the asteroid-like objects which have origins far outside the solar system and traveling at immense speeds. Not an asteroid in the conventional sense, the interstellar object of Oumuamua was discovered in 2017 as it rocketed through the solar system and shot out the other side uncaptured. A fragment of a planet's surface from a distant solar system, perhaps. A similar object, Borisov, was discovered soon after. From these few data points, we can extrapolate that there could be tens of thousands of such objects silently hurtling through our solar system every day. Tourists. From the scarce few comets, asteroids, and interstellar objects we detect, we infer the existence of vast populations of material out there in space. Likewise, relics we pull from the ground give testimony to ancient cultures we know very little of. The largest objects in our solar system have always commanded attention. As our telescopes improve, we reveal more and more of the small objects of our solar system. Things on a human scale, with chaotic movements, odd geometry, hidden treasures, and if and when we colonize the rest of the solar system, they will once again become immensely valuable. <laughs>